This morning I want to speak to you on God's portrait of a pastor. By the way, if you don't know where Pastor Tolbert is, he's been at a pastor's conference in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I think he left on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, and is flying back today. So that's where he is, uh, getting all those great uh, messages at the pastor's conferences and spiritual renewal. So I want to talk about the pastor day while the pastor is away. <laughs> now, it's all going to be good. Uh, I, I want us to see what God's portrait of a pastor is. Now, why is this message so important? Because, and this not only applies to our pastor, this applies to our elders, who are the leaders of our church. The way you view leadership will determine the kind of relationship you have with that leadership. And we want to have God's view of leadership so that we can have the proper relationship with our leadership in our church, our pastors and our elders. So I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and I want to read verses 6 through 8. By the way, there's an outline in your bulletin. Uh, I want to encourage you to take that out and jot down a few notes. Because what I'm talking about today is, is critical to the success of our church. The kind of view you have of leadership will determine your relationship. And your relationship with the leadership of this church, our pastor and our elders, will determine whether we are successful or not. So it's a very, very important message. Now John 1, 6-8 talks about John the Baptist. Jesus said, as this is recorded in Luke 7, 28, when John the Baptist uh, gave his life, Jesus, when he heard that he was gone, Jesus said there was, has been no one greater than John the Baptist ever born of a woman. He was a great, great man. And, he, and God used him in a tremendous way. And uh, through what is said about him in these verses, we see what God's portrait of a pastor is. John 1, beginning in verse 6, going through verse 8. The Apostle John said, There came a man, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light. He came to testify about the light. Notice it says that he came as a witness to the testimony about the light. He came to testify about the light. That was his main function. The work of a pastor can be the most satisfying and rewarding work a man could have. But there are also times that are very difficult, very disappointing. There are misunderstandings. There are petty and immature attitudes. There are unrealistic demands and expectations. There are false accusations. And there is opposition that causes a lot of stress. Believe me, I, I know what I'm talking about. I, I was a pastor 40 years, and there's probably not much that I did not experience or see. I've been to a lot of pastors' conferences. I've listened to other pastors and uh, heard a lot of stories of heartache. So even though it can be very rewarding, it can also be very difficult, very disappointing because of how some people view and treat the leadership. 
In too many churches today, their pastor's ministry has become one of heartache and not of joy like God designed it. One son has a vivid memory of the stress his pastor father went through. And he shares his testimony about his father. He says, even now I can visualize my dad slumped down in a chair, sobbing his heart out to God. I can still feel the quickening of his own pulse. As time after time he found it necessary to excuse himself from the evening meal due to nervous fatigue. Has his countenance changed? How his countenance changed during those days of adversity and difficulty? He began to stoop under the heavy load until almost broken in spirit and physically exhausted, his weary heart rebelled. Arriving home one day from school, I saw my father lying on the couch. His face was contorted. It was spelling out the severe pain in his chest, which had been brought about by the tension, the extreme burdens, and the pressures of a difficult ministry. My friend, God never said that pastors, there, there are times of difficulty and everything doesn't always go smoothly. But I guarantee you, God never intended for the pastoral ministry to be like this. Do you know that in, in just evangelical churches, I'm not talking about churches that are more moderate and liberal, do you know that in evangelical churches, 3,000 pastors a year lead the ministry? Now, sometimes they lead because the pastor has done something. It's his fault. But most of the time, it's because of the extreme burden of the ministry and the expectations of people. They just burn out. They give up. They can't go on. 3,000 pastors a year. Now, in these three verses, the Apostle John describes John the Baptist in three ways. And I am convinced that if we would remember these three factors, we would have a better relationship with our pastor, we'd have a better relationship with our elders, and the work of Christ would go forward in this church. God would give us success. God would bless our ministry here. So I hope you will write these down, and I hope you will think about them in your relationship with our pastor and with our elders in this church and how important it is. All right, number one, God's portrait of the pastor. God says he is a man with human limitations. He's a man with human limitations. John says, there came a man. There came a man. It's, it's the Greek noun anthropos where we get our English term anthropology. Anthropology is the study of what? Study of man. So it simply means a human being. There came a man. There came a human being. Yes, a pastor has the power of the Spirit of God in his life as others. But he also has limitations and problems and struggles just like you and I. Now, I'm not saying, and our pastor and our elders would not say this, I'm not saying we are to lower the standards of leadership outlining God's Word. Our leadership needs to maintain those. But I'm saying... There came a man and a pastor and elders. They're just men. They're human beings. And because of that, they're going to have limitations. Because of that, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to have problems. They're going to have struggles just like you do. They're just a little further along in the process. Now, let me give you three exhortations based on this statement. 
The first two is expectations of you as a congregation, how you look at the pastor and the elders. The third one it would be on what the leadership needs to do. Because they're just a man, they have limitations, human limitations, and struggles and problems. First one is this, and I hope you'll listen very carefully to this, because this is a big, big problem in church day. Because a pastor, because our elders, is just a man, be realistic in your demands and expectations. Be realistic in your demands and expectations. One church who was looking for a senior pastor developed the, the profile. And this was a real church that developed this profile of the kind of senior pastor they were looking for. They said he must be a good speaker, a deep Bible student, a spirited evangelist, a compassionate pastor, a man with wisdom the wisdom of Solomon. I really like that one. A man with the wisdom of Solomon. One who had a pleasing personality. Listen to this. One who's good looking. Uh, all ugly pastors is, forget it. Listen to this. He must have a wife who is compatible with all the members. He must be a good businessman. An effective administrator. Creative and original, able to come up with startling sermon topics to draw Sunday night crowds. Listen. The only person who would meet all these qualifications is Jesus Christ. And not every pastor is going to have all these things, and especially the expectations about it himself and his family. My friend, be realistic. I'm not saying lower your standards of leadership, but you got to be realistic in your demands and expectations. One thing I've learned, too, over the years, uh, a lot of times people's expectations in the congregation is different from what God says in his word his expectations are. In fact, a lot of times they are even more demanding. So be realistic in your demands and expectations. Because this is just a man. He has human limitations. He has problems. He has struggles. He's trying to serve the Lord. Second, I would say to you, be gracious be gracious and slow in your criticism. Be gracious and slow in your criticism. Somebody has written, If a pastor is young, they say he lacks experience. If his hair is gray, he's too old for the young people. If he has five or six children, he has too many. If he has no children, he's setting a bad example. If he preaches from notes, he has canned sermons and is dry. If his messages are extemporaneous, he is not deep enough. If he's attended to the poor in the church, they claim he is playing to the grandstand. If he pays attention to the wealthy, he is trying to be an aristocrat. If he uses too many illustrations in his sermon, he neglects the Bible. If he doesn't use enough stories in his sermon, he isn't clear. If he condemns the wrong, he's cranky. If he doesn't preach against sin, well, then he's just a compromiser. If he preaches the truth, he's offensive. If he doesn't preach the truth, he's a hypocrite. If he fails to please everybody, he's hurting the church and ought to leave. If he does please everybody, he has no convictions. If he drives an old car, he shames his congregation. If he drives a new car, he's setting his affection on earthly things. <laughs> if he preaches all the time, people get tired of hearing just one man. If he invites guest preachers, then he's shrieking his responsibility. And I really like this last one. 
If he, if he receives a large salary, he's a mercenary. If he receives a small salary, well, that just proves he wasn't worth much anyway. <laughs> I mean, we laugh, and this is funny, but I tell you, listening to other pastors and what I've experienced, a lot of times it's this way. You can't please everybody. I, I remember when I was invited to come candidate at First Baptist Church of Merced. The week I was, myself and my family were there, I met with the leadership. I'd already told the search committee this before they gave me an invitation to come. I told the leadership and the search committee, listen, I would like to believe if, if, the, if the congregation approves me coming to be the senior pastor of this church, I would like to believe that everybody would agree with me, everybody, you know, would be happy, uh, but I'm telling you, that's not going to happen. I've been in ministry long enough to know that's not going to happen. I'm not going to please everybody, and everybody's not going to probably stay uh, and we need to re remember that and we need to be gracious we need to slow be slow in our criticism I'm not saying that leaders sometimes they need to be confronted over a certain thing or but even if you're going to offer a criticism offer some alternative and making sure your criticism is valid Make your criticism to help the leadership of the church, not put them down. So, because the pastor is just a man, leadership is just men, we need to be realistic in our demands and expectations. And we need to be gracious and slow in our criticism. You need to ask yourself, before you criticize, would I want people saying this about me? And then the third exhortation is this. Because the pastor is just a man, that means he's got to live a disciplined life. He and the elders of the church, they have to live a disciplined life. Because we still live in this fleshly nature. See, here's what a lot of Christians don't understand once they get uh, saved. We are redeemed people in an unredeemed body. And we still have to fight the flesh. And that includes pastors and that includes elders. We're redeemed people. See, the real us is our, is our soul and spirit. We're just encased in this unredeemed body. Now, one of these days, God's going to give us a new body. Do you know about that? He's going to make everything new, and that includes our body. Man, I can't wait to that day. Don't have to worry about aches and pain. Don't have to worry about your weight or anything. You're going to have that great redeemed body. And But because we still live in the flesh, we have, and we have human limitations, that's why especially those in leadership must live a disciplined type of life. We must live a disciplined type of life. Uh, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians nine. And look at verses twenty five through twenty seven. Now Paul uses a sports analogy to talk about discipline, but he applies it to his leadership and applies it to the church. Everyone who he says in verse twenty five, everyone who competes in the games exercises self control in all things. 
They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way, not without aim. I box in such a way, not beating the air. But I discipline, I discipline my body and make it my slave. Why? So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Leaders, because they are just men and they have human limitations, we must live a disciplined life. Otherwise, we will be in danger of being disqualified from our ministry. So God says, when he looks at a pastor, when he looks at spiritual leaders, elders, he is a man with human limitations. But let me give you a second one, second factor. He is also a man with divine authority. He is also a man with divine authority. Notice John says, there came a man sent from God. Not only is he a man, but you must remember, he's a man sent from God. God sent him to your church. He's a man sent from God. You may be thinking when we were talking about the first point, if he's just a man, then why should I listen to him? Because he's a man sent from God. He's appointed by God. He has divine authority from God. He represents God and God's word. Now, God is, I want to give you an example of this, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the first one is in 1 Samuel 26. And this is a, a story between King David and, and Saul. And let me just tell you the, the story. Uh, you remember that Saul became quite jealous of David and he was chasing him and the men that were with him and he wanted to kill David. He wanted to get rid of him. And one night, Saul and his men that had been chasing David and his men were in a cave and they were asleep. And Saul's spear was beside where he was sleeping. And David and one of his men came in and they saw him sleeping. And his men said, Oh, king! Looky, God has delivered him to your hand. Let me strike him while he's sleeping. And I guarantee you, I won't have to strike a second time. And David said, Here's a, this man was trying to kill him. David said, no, who am I to raise up my hand against the Lord's anointed? I'm going to leave it in God's hands. As long as he's king, he's the Lord's anointed. And whatever he's done wrong, I'm going to let God take care of that. I will not raise up my hand against the Lord's anointed. See, God is not uh, telling us to respect a man's personality. We may not res respect their personality. We may not have a so-called chemistry with them. God is not telling us to respect a man's personality. He is telling us to respect his authority. Because that authority has been given to him by God. And this also applies to the church in, in responding to leadership in the church. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. 
Please turn your Bibles there because I want everybody to see this. And I want to explain what the writer is saying here. He starts out by saying, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Now, let me explain something. That doesn't mean you have to submit or obey their opinions. Leaders should be very careful not to give their opinion. They should base everything they do and say from the Word of God. But it's not saying you're to view their opinions. You're to submit to their opinion. You may have a better opinion. What he's talking about here is as long as your leaders are following the Word of God and they're trying to lead you to follow the Word of God and what we're doing in the church here, then cooperate with them. Don't give them a hard time. Because if they're trying to follow the Word of God, the one you're really fighting against is God. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why should we do this? For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. You know what he's saying there? One day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and God begins to ask about the ministry of this church, the ones who will give an account for that are the elders of this church. They are the ones responsible for keeping watch over your soul. They are the ones responsible in their oversight and leadership of the church. And they will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account. So since they're the ones that are going to have to give an account, it's like in the home. The husband is the leader of the family. When he stands before the judge to see the Christ, he's not going to ask the wives about what happened in that home or the children. He's going to ask that husband. And because of that awesome responsibility, don't give the leadership a hard time. Don't make it more difficult. Obey your leaders. Submit to them. Because they were the ones who keep watch over your soul and will give an account. And then, listen to this, let them do it with joy and not with grief. Because if it is one of grief, that will be both unprofitable for them and for you. Listen. When there's conflict in a church between people in the congregation and the leadership, nothing happens. There's no outreach. There's no ministry. Nothing happens. That's why Satan works 24-7 to try to get in us to fight one another. Because if he can get us fighting with one another, he knows he's got us. Don't make the ministry for our leadership to be one of grief. Work together. Let's work together. Let's, let's treat each other with respect and love. And God will give us joy. He will give us success and joy in the ministry. I read from a uh, church newsletter one time, an article is called How to Get Rid of a Pastor. And they gave these four suggestions. Number one, look him straight in the eye while he is preaching, and say amen once in a while, and he'll preach himself to death in a few weeks. Two, pat him on the back and brag on his good points, and he'll probably work himself to death. Three, I, I love this one. Rededicate your own life to Christ, 
and ask the pastor to give you a job to do, preferably to, to win some lost person to, to Christ, and he'll die of heart failure. And his last one is really good. Get the church to unite in prayer for the pastor, and he'll soon become so affected that a larger church will take him off your hands. It says, God says a pastor is a man with human limitations, but he's a man sent from God. He has divine authority, and that's why we should listen to the leaders of our church. They're trying to follow. Now, you may, in implementing certain biblical ministries in our church, you may have an idea, a better way of doing it than the leadership's going to. There's nothing wrong with that, going to leadership. But once they make a decision, we need to support that. We need to cooperate with them and support it and back it. And by the way, we need to be a part of it. We should not expect our leadership to do all the work. The leadership of this church is here to train you for the work of the ministry, and then they, along with you, we're all to do the work of the ministry. That's why God gave us spiritual gifts and ability. So there came a man, there came a man, so he has human limitations, Sent from God, he has divine authority. The third one, the third factor is in verses 7 and 8. He is a man with a heavenly commission. He not only has divine authority, he's a man with a heavenly commission. Two times in this passage he said, he's a witness, he's a witness to testify about the light. Verse 8, he, he's come to testify. He's not the light. He's come to testify about the light. The primary task of John the Baptist was to testify concerning the light. That is, in a dark world, he was sent to shine the word of God, proclaim the truth of God's word. See, that's what we're to do. That's what our leadership is to do in this church. We are living in a dark world. And I'm telling you, my friends, it's getting darker and darker and darker. And the primary task of this church and the primary task of our leadership is to constantly be shining the truth of God's word, the light of God's word in this dark world, in our dark community. And a pastor teacher of the church, Pastor Tolbert, my friend, this is his primary responsibility. Notice God does not say he's primarily to be a great administrator or the universal caller of the church. He's the one that makes all the visits. God does not say he's the one who with outstanding public relations skills. We need that. God does not say that he has to be a man with charisma, tremendous with people, or creative, an innovative program, or God does not say he's got to be the CEO type. He's a pastor teacher. He's a teaching shepherd. And that's how God accomplishes his work. That is his primary task. Now, it doesn't mean that, obviously, other things have to be done with the leadership to keep a church going, but his primary task is a proclaimer of the Word of God. He is constantly preparing himself and teaching the people and preaching to the people so that their lives will be changed. I want you to turn to 
2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. You need to read this as we, as we read it. Think about it. Paul is in prison for the last time. He's in a dungeon in Rome. He knows he's going to die. He's going to be executed by beheading. And he writes, young Timothy, giving some exhortations to carry on the work because he knows he's not going to be there anymore. It's a very, very personal letter. And the last thing that he says to him is this charge to preach the word. It's the last words he writes to him. He says in verse 1, I solemnly charge you, young Timothy. I solemnly charge you. This is a serious responsibility he's saying listen i charge you in the presence of god in christ jesus i charge you in the name of the one who judged the living and the dead i charge you based on his appearing and his kingdom preach the word he's saying this is a serious responsibility young timothy this is a serious responsibility pastors I charge you to preach the word. And then he says, be ready in season and out of season. You know what that means? Preach the word when they want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. Preach the word when it's popular, when it's not popular. Preach the word. And notice he says, preach the word. Not your ideas. Not the latest thing, fad going. Preach the word. Be, be ready in season, out of season. Then he says, in your preaching, reprove. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort in your preaching. Always do it with great patience and instruction. He's saying the preacher should always be ready to minister the Word of God. He needs to expose sin. That's what he means by correcting and rebuking. He needs to encourage right behavior. He needs to be patient, and he needs to teach sound doctrine. He's saying to Timothy, he's saying to everybody, nothing, nothing is more important than this. And then verses 3 and 4, he says there's an urgent need for this. He says, for the time will come. Why do you need to do this? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. My friend, that time has come. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desire. In other words, he's saying, Listen, the time will come where they will not want sound doctrine. What they want is have their ears tickled. They want somebody to tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. They want to be entertained. But he says, when that happens, and their ears are tickled by a teacher, they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will turn aside to miss. Why do they turn aside to miss? Because they have no discernment. They're not being taught the Word of God. You can't have discernment knowing right and wrong, truth and error, unless you know the Word of God. But he says, Timothy, verse 5, you... All this is going to happen, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. It's going to be hard at times, Timothy. 
do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, this commitment will cost you. Endure hardship. Proclaim the gospel to law. Teach the word of God. Fulfill your ministry. My friend, listen. We should never, ever expect our pastor to give so much time to other things. He neglects his ministry. And the elders of the church too, but especially our pastor. This is his primary responsibility. And I would say to you today, and I believe that our pastor wants to develop this kind of reputation. When I was at First Baptist Church of Merced, I began to tell people after I'd been there about a year or two, I want to develop a reputation in our community where people are saying, if you want to know the Word of God and how it applies to your life, there's a church you can go get it. And we were able to develop that kind of reputation. And I believe Pastor Tolbert wants to have that kind of reputation in this church. Which means that you've got to give him time to prepare and not expect so much of him that he's going to neglect this ministry. We need to have that kind of reputation. We would also tell people who have been visiting our church and looking about joining, I'm sure that you've seen the time you've been here that preaching and teaching the Word of God is a primary focus in our church. You'll hear it from the pulpit. You'll hear it in classrooms. You'll hear it in adult ministry, youth ministry, children's ministry. This is the primary focus of our ministry. And if that's not what you want, this is not the church for you. We need to be saying that to people. We need to be honest with them what we're all about. And this is going to be a primary focus. So a pastor who understands God's portrait would say, I'm just a man, so I'm limited in how much I can do, and I guarantee you I'm going to make mistakes. He would say, I believe God has called me to this ministry, so I've come with His authority. And he would say, I want to be faithful, a faithful preacher and teacher of the Word of God. I believe this is a serious responsibility. And I believe it's my responsibility to this church. My friend, this is God's portrait of a pastor. You can choose to ignore what you've heard today. And yeah, if you try hard enough, you can give our leadership a hard time. But my friend, the, if you want the work of this church to go forward, you've got to look at our leadership the way God does. And you've got to work with them and cooperate with them. And we together, with the leadership and the people, we together can see God do great things in this community. We can see God grow his church and do wonderful things that one day 
As people come to this church, they say, those people love the Lord. They love the Word of God. Look at the joy in their life. And friend, listen. People do not need to hear another story about church fighting. They need to see what the Lord can do when he has control of a congregation.